Um, I'm going to start with a video, a kind of funny video. Sometimes laughter is contagious. This is a video of a little bit of laughter. Here you go. There's a line in scripture in Romans 15, 12, that says, or 12, 15, that says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, and I suppose laugh with those who laugh. I'll, I'll get to that verse in a, in a minute again. But I want to begin by reading a, an array of verses, all from Romans, that tell us what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to live. And what I want you to do is process in your head would Jesus, did Jesus do this stuff? We're supposed to do this? Did Jesus do this? Okay? So here we go. Use your mind. I'll just break it into little pieces. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Jesus do that? Really. Right? It says, hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Did he passionately want to do what is good? Right? Uh, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Did he love people genuinely? Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Did he do that? Work hard, serve the Lord enthusiastically? I think so. Rejoice in our confident hope. Did he always have hope? Uh, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Did he do that? I think so. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Right? Always be eager to practice hospitality. Always welcoming. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God would bless them. He do that? And then live in harmony with each other. Did you do that? Now I read all these verses. And, and I, I think he would say, yeah, yeah, he did that, and he did that, and he did that, and he did that, and he did that. Now, here's my question. I have one more. I skipped over one phrase. I want you to see if you think he did this. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Did he do that? Yeah, I think so. Rejoice with people that are rejoicing, mourn with those who are mourning. Yeah, I think he did that. So, for the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about anger. I'm talking about anger with God. We all know people. I certainly know people that are angry with God. And I quoted somebody that would like to get his hands around God's neck and choke God and demand God, explain yourself to me kind of thing. We know people that can be very angry with God. And my question this morning is, when we're angry, when we experience anger, does God share our anger? Because he rejoices with those who rejoice and he mourns with those who mourn. Does he also share our anger when we're angry? Now, sometimes we get angry for silly reasons. I'm not talking about silly anger. I'm talking about anger with substance, not just deeply felt, but legitimate anger about situations that are unjust in some capacity. Does he share our anger? Now, when I say Jesus and anger, there's probably one story that comes to your mind, right? First story, what comes to your mind? Well, it's the time when Jesus got angry in the temple. It was a righteous anger, right? So here's, here's the pattern of worship for them. We have a pattern of worship. They have a pattern of worship. Their pattern of worship involved at least two things. But the two things I want to focus on are money and sacrifices. 
Uh, we don't pass the offering basket through the pews anymore, but we put it at the back. That doesn't mean that giving money is not an element of worship. It still is. Uh, giving money to God is not like just paying the church or whatever. It is an, a, an element of an act of worship. And it certainly was for them. So when I traveled from wherever I was to worship God in the temple back in the day, conditions were different. Because different areas had different units of money that they used. And actually, the temple itself had something called a temple shekel. shekel. It was unique to the temple itself. And so if I came from wherever, Greece, I, and I wanted to give money to God, I had to change my Greek money, whatever Greek city-state there was, I had to change that into the, the, to the currency of the temple. And, and that's where money changers came involved. It was an exchange, a currency exchange. And the pain in the neck thing is they charged exorbitant rates. Have any, anybody ever gone to a sports contest somewhere like the Eagles game today kind of thing? How much do they charge for hot dogs down there? Well, they, they could charge 10, well, I don't know what they charge, but they could charge $10. And we all know that you can get a whole pack of hot dogs for a couple of dollars. That's a real ripoff. That's the way this was. This was a real ripoff. So I'm coming to worship God. It's not just a sports stadium. I'm coming to worship God and they're charging exorbitantly high exchange rates is just unfair. Second element of worship that's mentioned or referenced in this scripture is sacrifices. So Mary had a little lamb, right? Mary had a little lamb and was raised at home. We, we cherish this lamb. This is a perfect unblemished lamb. This is a perfect sacrifice. And I travel from wherever I am to worship God in the temple in Jerusalem. I've been looking forward to this. I bring along with me my perfect lamb that I want to give as a gift to God. And they have these temple inspectors and they look over the animal and they say, typically, no, nah, that's not going to cut it. But now we do have some acceptable animals over here we can sell you. Here they are. Here's the price list. And again, it's a ripoff. And Jesus sees this. He becomes angry. He says, this isn't right here. This is not right. And so he flips over the money changers' tables, the currency tables, and, and he, he chases the animal sellers out of the temple courtyard. He says, this isn't going on here. This isn't right. He displays a righteous anger. Question. Is Jesus the only person that's angry about those injustices? No. Everybody's ticked off. And it's really offensive. It's, it's offensive to go to a sports stadium and get your, pay, pay $10 for a hot dog or whatever. But it's even more offensive when it's the church. When the church, the temple, is ripping you off. It's like, in the name of God, they're ripping you off. It's really offensive. And so... The people were offended, and Jesus was offended. It's just not right. It's just not right. And so Jesus rejoices with us when we rejoice. He mourns with us when we mourn. And I think, at least in that case, he's angry with us when we're angry. Like I said, I've been talking about anger for the past couple of weeks. And the illustration that I used biblically last week was the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, three siblings who were very close to Jesus. They weren't just followers of Jesus. They loved Jesus. They were Jesus' friends. And as his friends, they thought we were tight. Mary and Martha were concerned Lazarus was sick and dying. They sent word to Jesus, Jesus, hurry, come quickly. Lazarus is near death. And Jesus shows up late. Lazarus has already been dead for four days by the time Jesus shows up. And they're angry, in my opinion, with Jesus. Like, what is up with this? So Mary's so mad, I told you last week, that she doesn't even come out of the house to talk to Jesus. She stays in the house. Martha goes out to meet Jesus. And the first thing off Martha's lips is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What does that mean? Finger out on Jesus' chest. Jesus, you could have prevented this. Has anybody ever felt like that? Yes. Yes. Everybody here has some story you could tell, like God could have prevented this. Whatever this is, God could have prevented it. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. A little later, Jesus says, hey, where's Mary? 
Mary comes out, maybe reluctantly, I don't know, but she comes out to Jesus, first thing out of her lips. Same thing as Martha. Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then her eyes well up with tears. And they begin to overflow. Tears started streaming down her cheeks. And you know what Jesus did next? You might say, well, he wept. Uh, that's later, not initially. Now, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, okay? Not all versions have the same language, but some Bible scholars who put this book together had a very interesting phrase in it. Listen, Mary, Mary just says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then, it's, and then she begins to tear. And then it says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and saw the others wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. He was angry. There's something in the original text that led these translators to say he felt anger. Now, you help me figure this out. Why in the world would Jesus be angry? Because it's his fault. If Jesus had only been here early enough, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And you got the audacity to be angry? Like, what is up with that? Like, why? Help me understand this. How in the world could Jesus possibly be angry? This doesn't make sense. Okay, let's, let's detour for that for a minute. Let's pretend. I'm going down a different path for a moment. Let's pretend I'm an inventor. And I invent this brilliant thing that's a lot more complex than it is in reality. This, do you know what this is? This is an M&M dispenser, okay? Does anybody have any idea why it's empty? <laughs> My wife loves M&Ms. If you want to get her a Christmas gift or a birthday gift, that would be perfect. So anyway, this is, this is an M&M dispenser in our house at least. And uh, it's not very complex, but let's say it is. And I invent it. And I, and I get a patent on it. And I think to myself, you know what? I think this is going to sell. And I decide I'm going to make M&M dispensers. And I'm not market them. I'm going to sell them all over the place. I'm going to sell these things. And so, but I don't have the money to make a, a factory. I don't have the money to make this all happen. So I, I get a loan. I, I put my house uh, as uh, up as collateral and I say, hey, here, give me the money and whatever else. And I take out this big loan and I make an M&M factory, and it, uh, an M&M dispenser factory, and it starts small, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, all of you are my employees. <laughs> and uh, I love you all. I'm a very unique owner of a business. I really care about my employees, and I try to create, genuinely try to create a good spirit among us. So every Friday, we have hecky sandwiches. That's just everybody. Hecky sandwiches. And we, we have picnics sometimes and parties and things like that. I'm, I try to create. I treat you well. I pay you pretty well. It's reasonable for what you're doing. It's, it's really a good thing. And then at some point along the way, one of you, one of you, one of you, <laughs> has an attitude, and you begin to look at what I have taken out of the business and what you're, the pittance that you're getting paid, and you begin to think, this isn't fair. Now, I put up the collateral of my house. I've taken all kinds of, this is on my shoulders. I should be making more money than you. I'm the guy, I invented this. I, I should be making some more money, and I've been treating you fair, but it doesn't matter. You start getting a little negative. And then you start talking to somebody else. And then a group of you. And eventually, and I'm not trying to go political today, but at some point you all decide you're going to unionize. And <laughs> you're all in a union. And I'm in, me <laughs> we're not political, we're not going anywhere. I saw faces and stuff. Like, I'm, I'm the manager, I'm the owner, operator here, and you all are unionized. And what happens? All of a sudden, the dynamic that we had before, the relationship we had before, the, 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 the sandwiches on Fridays, and the, it's, it's just starting to go away, and there's hostility and distrust, and it's just not the same. It's not the same, and it, it breaks my heart. 
This is not the company I wanted to create. This isn't the way I wanted it to go. And the hostility, it's just, we were a family and we're not a family anymore. We're just not a family. It's not right. In the very beginning, when God created this game of life, he had a beautiful idea. His idea was, I'm going to create this business. I'm going to create this game. I'm going to create this company. I'm going to create this life. And, and we're all going to get along. And we're going to have unity with nature. It's just going to be a beautiful experience in every conceivable way. It's going to be excellent. And, and he only put out one rule that everybody in the family, everybody in the family of life has to abide by. And that's this. You can't eat of this particular tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't. Everything else is fair game. We're all going to have a good life. You just can't eat of this tree and if you do the scripture says if you eat its fruit you're going to die now what's the implication of that if you don't eat this fruit then what you won't die you won't ne ever die like the whole idea the whole concept of death was not in play like god did not create a world where we get old he didn't create a world that we would get diseases. He didn't create a world where there would be car accidents. He didn't create a world where there would be tragedy. He didn't get a, create a world where there would be paralysis. He created a world that was absolutely perfect. And then there, were, there was a rebellion in the ranks in the way that God ran things. And all of a sudden, this went from this harmonious, beautiful experience to something much, much less than that. That's the world that God created, and it was turning into something else. And when Jesus came into this world, he came into a world that was perverted from its original intent. God created a perfect world that was now perverted from its perfect intention to a world that was characterized much more by rebellion against him. It's not just Adam and Eve's fault. It's, it's us. All living in a sense of rebellion against his perfect, harmonious, loving, wonderful, peace-giving ways. Messed up. Let me return to the passage of scripture that I'm talking about in John chapter 11. So Jesus arrives in the scene. And Mary says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, if you had been here, Jesus, my brother wouldn't have died. And then she starts tearing up. And when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. And he was deeply troubled. Why? Why? Because this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be this way. There wasn't supposed to be death. Now, they were upset. Jesus, if you only had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. That's their level of anger. That's why they're angry. Jesus is level and angry in a different level for a different reason. Jesus is saying, this didn't have to be. Not only did Lazarus not have to die, no one had to die. No one had to have conflict. No one had to be miserable. That's what Jesus is saying. When Jesus saw her weeping and the other people weeping with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. When I read the scripture earlier, Romans 12, 15, and Jesus is happy with those who are happy and mourning with those who are mourning. I think he is angry with those who are angry about justifiable things to be angry with. But maybe from a different perspective. So Jesus sees her weeping and the other people, deep anger within him. And then he says, where have you placed him? Where's his body? That's a different tone of voice right now. See, see, Jesus laughs with those who laugh, mourns with those who mourn. You were seeing him mourn now. The softer voice. Angry with those who are angry. Softer voice this time. Where'd they put him? He's mourning with her. Where'd they put him? <sighs> they told him, Lord, come and see. Come and see. And then Jesus went and saw, and then it says, he wept. 
He weeps with those who weep, and he laughs with those who laugh, and I think he gets angry with those who are angry. Watch this, next slide. Come and see, Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. So they see that Jesus is mourning with those who are mourning. And then it says, but some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? What's underneath that? What's the emotion underneath that? He healed a blind man. Why didn't he heal this guy? What's the emotion of anger? Then it says, next line, Jesus was still angry when he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. He's still angry. See, anger is a theme in this story, as well as mourning. He's still angry when he comes to the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. Roll the stone aside. He's still angry. Now, what does this prove? Who cares? Who cares? If you're angry about something and Jesus shares your anger, what does it, ma what does it matter? Does it really matter to you? There's a line in scripture in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, that says this. God says, I will take revenge. I'll pay them back. In due time, their feet will slip. Their day of disaster will arrive, and their destiny will overtake them. There's, there's a line. I memorize it. The King James Version of the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord God of hosts. What does that mean? I'm going to make things right in the end. I'm going to take revenge. I'm going to correct wrong things. There's a line in the New Testament, in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, that says this. It's very interesting. It says this of death. How many of us like death? I don't like death. None of us like death. It says, oh, death, oh, death, where is your victory? Because death is an enemy of us. Oh, death, death is something that was not supposed to exist. That was the original plan when God created this company. Oh, death. Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? This is written with anger. Death, get out of here. It goes on. For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and the death to our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that really means? I could talk, talk, talk about that for some length of time, but I just want to cut to the chase and say, this verse is saying that Jesus came to kick death in the teeth. That's what it means. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord God of hosts. And you're angry about death? God is angry about death. And one day he's going to kick death in the teeth. And he's going to make it all right. He's going to make things right. And things aren't right right now. And so Jesus comes into this scene and things aren't right. And so when he sees Mary crying, he cries too. And he gets angry. This is what it says. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled at its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he's been dead for days, for four days. The smell will be terrible. You can't do this. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, Father, thank you for hearing me. Thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all the people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. And then Jesus shouted, I think shouted in anger, Lazarus, come forth. Like we're going to make this right. This is wrong. Lazarus, come out right now. And the dead man came out, of the, uh, out, came out hands and feet bound in grave clothes. And his face was wrapped up in a head cloth around him. And then Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. And then and then what happened? What happened then? The dead man came out of the tomb. The, the, the force, for, focal point of their anger was negated. It was corrected. Just like God one day is going to correct the garbage of your life. One day, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord God of hosts. One day, God is going to take, kick death in the teeth. And we see it happening right in this scripture. God is right before our eyes, kicking death in the teeth. And all of a sudden, Lazarus comes out. This is what one day is going to happen to us. Things are going to be made right. God is making it right, right here, right now. And, and 
death is no more. And God comes, Lazarus comes out of the tomb, and, and Jesus says, unwrap him. And then what do the people do? What do the people do? What do the people do? They begin to shout and dance like it's, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And you know, you know what Jesus is doing? He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Because what? What does the scripture say in Romans? What does it say in Romans? Romans 12, 15. What did that say? It says that Jesus rejoices with those who rejoice, and he mourns with those who mourn, and I think he's angry with those who are angry. And we see it all in this story. He's angry with the women for a different reason that they can't possibly understand, and he's mourning with them the way we do understand it because he weeps. And then when they rejoice, he rejoices. And one day, one day he's going to make it right. So here's what I've been talking about. Very difficult issue. Because we know, we know people that are very angry at things of life, but also often at God. Very angry. I would like to get my hands around God's throat and just choke him. We know people like that. Here's the message of the last couple of weeks. Number one, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the battle that we sometimes have with God. We behave like teenagers arguing with the parents. And it goes back and forth. God, this can't be. God, you're wrong. This isn't what the, you got to do it my way, not your way. You can't let it go down this way. We argue with God and then finally the parent puts their foot down. Remember that? And what does the parent say? The parent says, this is the way it's going to be because I said so. And that infuriates a kid even more. Just like we can get infuriated with God. And if we're smart as Christians, we don't defend God. God has big shoulders. He can handle himself. But it feels like that. It feels like God says, because I said so. What does it mean when a parent says, because I said so to the teenager? What does it really mean? It says, look, this is going to have to end this discussion. It's over. I'm sorry, but I'm wiser than you. I have a bigger picture in mind. I know more than you know. I've got this covered. You're going to have to trust me. That's what I said a couple of weeks ago. You may not like God. You might be angry with him. But he's saying, because I said so, I hate it, it just infuriates me more, but because I said so, this is the way it's going to be, you're going to have to trust me. Talked about that a couple weeks ago. Then last week, I introduced a real life story of people that really did have some anger against God. Mary and Martha were upset because Lazarus died. First thing they said to Jesus was, Jesus, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Our brother wouldn't have died. How do you deal with that? And I talked about a family that would have had a right to be angry with God. I talked about that. So I done, did this recent funeral. I talked about the Reichert family. Larry and Linda, husband and wife, and children, Karen and Eric, talked about that. I talked about how Eric, when he was 16 years old, had a cancerous tumor that stretched from his back onto his chest, was woven into his body parts. They were told in April of 1988, Eric would not be alive by Christmas. And praise God, he answered our prayers, and he's still alive to this day. But why does a 16-year-old get cancer in the first place, God? And then I talked about Karen, at the age of 42, had an episode of cancer and ended up dying. 42 years old. And then I talked about Linda. Developing, becoming, having dementia at the age of 61 and dying at the age of 71 just a couple of weeks ago. And I talked about how do they deal with that? How do you deal with this? How do you live with this? And I suggested that here's what we need to do. My favorite Bible verse, which is uh, 2 Corinthians 4.18, where it says, you fix your attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. Because what can be seen lasts only for a time. What cannot be seen last forever. So Larry's focal point could be, could be seeing his wife, Linda, dying in the hospital, in the nursing home, the last day of her life. Or he could focus on something that they described when I prepared for the funeral. And what, I, what he described to me was how years earlier, Karen, when she was still alive, liked to play the piano and Linda liked to sing as Karen played these hymns. And I said, you can focus on thinking about Linda dying in the, ho in the nursing home or you can focus on Karen and Linda playing the piano and singing in the realm of heaven. You can focus on either. The scripture says you fix your attention not on what you can see, but what you can't see. Because what you can see lasts only for a time. What you cannot see lasts forever. One, because I said so. Doesn't seem fair. Trust me. Because I said, this is just the way it is. 
I understand things more deeply than you understand them. Secondly, focus not on what you can see, but what you can't see. That'll help you function in this life. But today I'm adding one more element to it. God one day is going to kick death in the teeth. One day. Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord God of hosts. One day, he's going to make things right. Are you angry? Yes, he is too. Because this is not the life that he prepared. This was not his plan. He had a perfect world. And he's ticked off. And one day, God is going to make it right. In the meantime, all three messages have the same application point. Because I said so. You're going to need to trust me. You're going to need to trust me because it said so. Fix your attention, not on what you can see, but what you can't see. Because what you can see lasts only for a time. What you cannot see lasts forever. You need to trust me. That is going to be the reality. Focus on what will be, not what you've experienced. Focus on what will be, what I'm going to do. Focus on that. And you can trust me to even the score. It's going to be okay in the end. I know you're mad, but I'm going to make it right. You can guarantee, you can take that to the bank. I'm going to make it right. And we see a visual experience of him making it right in the story of Lazarus dying in the presence of his two sisters. He made it right. And they jumped up and down. And one day, you and I, we're going to be jumping up and down for joy about the very things that we were so upset about because God one day is going to make it all right. And so as you go through the experiences of life, be sure that you know that you're not alone in this. Because Jesus, Jesus is sad and grieves with you about things that are breaking your heart. He is crying too. And when you're angry about things that upset you, he's angry about those things too. Because it shouldn't be that way. And one day, when you rejoice, he's going to be rejoicing with you. Fix your attention, not what you can see. What you can't, but what you can't see. Because what I've been describing is what you can see. One day, it's going to be made right. And one day, we're all going to be rejoicing. Let's pray together. Lord God, I, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and move us by the power of your Holy Spirit and bring real, authentic comfort to us, Lord God. Bring comfort to us. We're at a loss right now, often in life. But I pray that you would comfort the people in this room and the people listening on the internet. And I pray that you would help us all, every one of us, every one of us, to suspend doubt, to lay aside the anger, and to truly trust you and put our hope in you who identifies with our life experiences and has a greater plan in store for us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. I think we're done. They abandoned me. So have a great week. It's wonderful. Go in peace. And have some uh, hot chocolate and cookies.